we approach clinical examination of any joint is to be aware of certain key principles which help us in making a judicious examination and making a judicious provisional diagnosis. These key elements are the diagnosis comes to a prepared mind just as luck favors a prepared mind. So we must have a mental template or a template of categories of various differentials in our mind before we approach a patient. The second key element is that the more precise the clinical data we collect, the more accurate will our diagnosis be. And the third key element is that whenever we are called upon to examine a joint, we must comment on five things, whether it is painful or pain-free, whether the disease is intra-articular or arthritic, or extra-articular, non-arthritic, whether the joint is stable or unstable, whether the joint is deformed or not, and whether there is any stiffness. These five points, they apply to all the joints, whether it is elbow, knee, or whatever. We must comment on, recognize this, identify this, and make a note. And then we synthesize this into a provisional diagnosis. In orthopedics, the diagnosis is slightly unique, that here we are supposed to speak about the disease and disability both. This is something unique to orthopedics. So before we enter the nitty gritty of the subject, let us first understand what a student is being examined for. Why we do what we do, that is the cognitive domain. One of uh, the examiners out of the four, he is looking into these aspects. How do we do what we do? He's, he's testing you on, in the psychomotor domain. And one of them is observing you between why and how. Is the comfort of the patient kept in view? The affective domain. So let us, uh, that was the universal principle. Let us focus on hip now. I do not see what mine doesn't know. So to make a good diagnosis, we must know that out of these four anatomical layers that the hip joint has, where does the problem arise? Whether it is osteochondral layer, capsulolabral layer, musculotendinous layer, or neurovascular layer. And as you know, that there is a kinematic chain. Hip is the connecting link between the torso and the lower extremities. So when we begin our examination, it is good to have this mental template in mind. We should examine the hip, keeping in mind that I have to identify whether this is an arthritic hip or a non-arthritic hip or the symptoms are arising because of the hip spine syndrome. Arthritic hip could be stable or unstable. Stable are inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, infective, tubercular, degenerative primary and secondary osteoarthrosis, developmental congenital dislocations, and uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis and post-traumatic arthritic joints. So these are the stable arthritic joints. The unstable joints, they are largely non-arthritic, but in later stages, they can become unstable. They can become arthritic. Non-arthritic joints, the stable variety, generally the intra-articular kinds, we do not get in our exams, whether it is BNB final, or MS, generally these intra-articular pathologies are not kept because do, they generally do not have any deformities. Similarly, the extra-articular, we generally come across three impediments, the most common. We will just uh, see what they are. Three capsular problems, 
three snapping syndromes and deep gluteal syndrome and pubic pain, sacroiliac pain, antithopathies and avalgen injuries, stress fractures, mild tenderness <coughs> and tears, bursitis. But non-arthritic, this is the category which you will get in exam. The sifuli of septic arthritis of the hip, non-union of the neck of the femur or intertrochanted fractures, CDH, DDH, neglected traumatic dislocations, resorption and destruction of the head. These conditions generally are non-arthritic, but they can become arthritic in later stages. Hip spine syndrome can be simple, complex, secondary, or misdiagnosed. Simple are that there is a pathology in the spine, pathology in the hip, but patient comes to you with only one pathology. Simple. Complex are that both the sides are symptomatic and you have, the clinician has to decide by either doing a foraminal block or an intraarticular block to decide which of the two is the cause uh, of his current problem. The secondaries are that there is a hip deformity of long standing and patient comes to you with scoliosis and pain. There are secondary hip spine syndrome and misdiagnosis is the fourth category. Three most common impediments are trochanteric pelvic impingement, issue femoral impingement, and subspine, anterior inferior ligic spine impingement, three snappings which are commonly encountered. See, what I'm saying is that before we start our clinical examination, one should have this information, this mind should be prepared that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to identify one of these. Iliosauce, or the iliopectineal eminence, iliotibial band, and the posterior border and the anterior border of the gluteus medius, and the proximal hamstring of the ischiofibrosity. Three capsulolabral problems, adhesive capsulitis, atraumatic instability, and capsulolabral tears. Deep gluteal syndrome. Most of us are generally not aware of this, but I, I, I suggest that if we could uh, read a few more, this is an article in Skeletal Radiology, one of the very good articles on the subject. And uh, uh, the commonest is the piriformis syndrome. So during clinical examination, we will see that how piriformis syndrome is identified or ruled out. So what if we ignore the first key element? and do not prepare the mind. So this is what will happen. A uninformed or an empty mind will lead on to a purposeless or a barred examination. It would be just a keen to go in the dark and the candidate shall pick up pebbles from the show. Either he will not be able to make a diagnosis or make a relevant differential diagnosis or propose a wild diagnosis. So, but on the other hand, the prepared mind with a structured thought that we just discussed will lead on to a pertinent history taking, particularly negative history taking, if you have that template in mind, and examination keeping possibilities in mind, and shall dive deep and pick up precious jewels, make a relevant diagnosis. So, the second and third key element are the more precise the clinical data we collect, the more accurate will our diagnosis be. We should ask ourselves that how does a clinician get better at making a clinical diagnosis? By understanding the controversies on the subject, by avoiding the pitfalls in our clinical methods, and fulfilling the prerequisites for various tests that we shall be doing, and a mindful regimentation. Following a set order of examination, every time one examines a particular joint, and the more we practice, the more we, we learn. The fluidity, the, the flow in the examination comes, the rhythm comes with practice. Patients with hip problem generally present with groin pain, limp, and limited internal, internal rotation. 
These are the presenting <coughs> symptoms. Patient, as you can see here, will either point out like a trochanteric C sign or a trochanter triangular triangulation sign or a pointer. <coughs> it is good if we learn for in our presentation to make visual analog score that on a, on a scale of 10, the pain is this much. It was five, five months ago. Today it is seven. So if this kind of communication, if you make with your examiners, this will leave a good impression. OPRST, onset, progression, quality of pain, all these things one should be aware. The disability, if it is possible, you will leave an impact on the examiner. If you can use a Harris hip score, give a score, so this is the disability today. Even as a clinician, you will require it, that before surgery and after surgery. See, these uh, uh, in, in instruction course, we have assembled here, not only to discuss the content, but one of the aims that the faculty here has is to coach you into how to take an exam. So there may be certain things which are not exactly the content, but they are aimed at the coaching. So understanding the tool of hip examination in history, this, uh, uh, the master chart I just showed, keep that in mind, make a visual analog score in the history. In the history, try to make out whether it's an active or a heel disease, whether it is progressive and negative history. Focus on the disability, that how the activities of daily living are affected. It is with reference to ADLs that we, that, that we decide on the disability. The activities of daily living, all of you are aware, mainly these five, transference, ambulation, personal hygiene, clothing, and eating. So with reference to these, right from the history taking, you begin to identify that how, what, your, what is the disability. <coughs> Try to objectivize the pain and the disability using these scores. And at the end of the clinical examination, your, your history taking, do comment whether the patient is able to sit and uh, sit squat and sit cross-legged. We move on to our clinical examination, start with attitude. It is a comment on the general body habitus, <coughs> alignment of head, neck, and torso, and lower limb. As you can see in this patient, this is a patient of slip capital femoral epiphysis with extreme external rotation, and there is scissoring. So we comment on these attitudes of the limbs, the, whether there is any misalignment there, anything observable. We go on to the inspection part. <coughs> inspection is not a mindless walk through a ritual. It is a mindful observation to decipher which of the three categories the hip may belong, whether it is arthritic, non-arthritic, or a hip spine syndrome. So keeping this thing in mind, we approach the patient and inspect it. Three signs that alert the clinician to one of the three categories are a lumbar nodosis would indicate a central plane deformity, level of ASIS indicate a coronal plane deformity, and level of malleoli or the patellae would indicate limb shortening. So we start the inspection. See the alignment from the front first, and see the anterior superior level of the anterior superior iliac spines. Then we focus on the iliac fossae, the scarpa's triangle, the lateral prominence of the greater trochanter, the level of the petalae, and the level of the malleoli. From the side, we see whether there is any lordosis any scars, surgical or <coughs> primarily healed. Similarly, from the back side, we see if there is anything remarkable, any wasting of the muscle, the gluteal force, 
the posterior superior allex spines. <coughs> Inspection after having done in supine, lateral, prone, we make observation in the sitting and standing position. In scanning, primarily inspection would consist of the alignment, whether there is any disturbance in the sagittal plane or the coronal plane, and whether <coughs> the patient is using the, we try to read the compensatory mechanisms that the patient is employing. So what we do, what, that we collect the inspection findings in different positions severally that we just mentioned but present them together as a single composite narration. See, in exam, it's an exam. You have only 10 to 15 minutes. You cannot, you have to make a distinction between a, between a class and an exam. So you make a composite presentation. After this, we do the markings identify the symphysis pubis, and this is how we identify the anterior superior ilex spine. The first bony point that hits the thumbnail, we confirm <coughs> it from coming from above down, identify it, and then we identify the midpoint of this <coughs> ligament. This is the midpoint. This is the point which surgeons identify for their Burgess disease. For orthopedic surgeons, it is this, 2.2 centimeter below and lateral. <coughs> this is the anterior joint line, which is of interest to you and me. And this is where we do the vascular sign of narrow. This is the anterior joint line, and we feel the floor resistance. Similarly, we identify the tip of the uh, greater preventer, coming from bone to soft tissue, then from soft tissue to bone. The first bony structure that strikes your, your thumbnail we confirm it, make sure that our point is we do slight rotation, adduction, make sure, and then we move on to the midpoint of the patella. This is identified, the tuberosity is identified. These patellar landmarks are identified to comment on the rotation later. This is how we palpate and mark the tip of the middle medullus, the upper pole of the patella, to look at the base thing, and the generally 15 centimeter proximal to the proximal pole, take the measurements, then we move on to the posterior side, mark the posterior superior eyelid spines, <coughs> Ilex crest, the L4, L5 level, right up to L1, D12, B mark. We identify this is the other side of the bridge preventer. That was the involved side. This is the other side, the left side. And then we mark the posterior joint line. We join the posterior superior ilex spine and the tip of the bridge preventer. The line the middle two thirds and the lateral one third, this point is the posterior joint line. We mark the fibrosity. <coughs> we move on to the palpation. Friends, there are three cardinal rules of palpation. The first one, and I wish all of us remember this, the more one's touch is feather, the more one gathers. Touch your patient's gently. Do not just poke your fingers into the, into the patient. The more gently you touch, the more findings you will pick up. And the fingers of an orthopedic surgeon must begin to see and read four features of a bone. As we grow as our clinicians, the moment our fingers touch a bone, 
we must run in our mind whether the surface of the bomb is smooth, rough, or variegated. Each one has a meaning. Rougher surface in infection, variegated in, in the tumors. Thicker, whether the broadening is centric or, or circumferential. Deformity, is this bone deformed? And is it tender or not? While doing palpation, one thing which is very subtle, one should, the candidate should be vigilant whether the disease or active, active or deep, and this is made out by looking at the spine. So we start the palpation, we follow an order, we begin from the eye thickness, compare, running those four things in mind when I'm touching the eye thickness, I know whether they are comparable or not. And by when I say comparable or not, I'm running those four things in my mind. I look for the IDF proceed, whether I'm able to hold the, the IDF press between my thumb and finger. We read the scarpa's triangle, palpate for the flow resistance, the vascular sign of nerve, and then we move on to the greater trochanter. Again, at the, when I'm at the greater trochanter, I am running those four things whether the surface is smooth, whether it is thickened, roughened, deformed, or tender. Biotrochantic tenderness I have tested, and the rocking of the pelvis, the proximal thigh I am palpating, whether it is thickened, circumferential, or it is comparable on the two sides. The petli, the level of the petli, and similarly, the level of the medulla. We move on to the ischial fibrosity, palpate them, whether the surfaces are smooth, roughened, the inferior MI and the superior MI, posterior superior IX spine, and uh, the posterior joint line and the posterior tendons. The wasting. The tenderness of the spine at 4 5. <coughs> then we move on to the next head of examination, and that is the deformity. They can be present in the sagittal plane, the fixed flexion deformities, or in the coronal plane and rotational plane. So all of these we have to identify, and uh, this is one way of doing. We look at the anterior superior ilex spines. The left side is the affected one. You can see a heel scar there. This ASI is one at the lower level, meaning thereby that there was an abduction deformity. I'm trying to. I'm trying to square the pelvis using Perkins method and see that uh, the two ASIS are level. And uh, this is, I have revealed the abduction deformity on this side. Suppose if uh, I was not able to square this pelvis, then another method available to us was that uh, we employ the Kothari's method we first draw an interspinous line between the two SIS. We draw a midline. Crossing this interspinous line, and then from the two ASIS, we drop the horizontal to the midline, a vertical to the midline. So this is the angle formed on this side. And similarly, the angle is drawn from the opposite ASIS the angle formed on the opposite ASIS is the index deformity angle. Then we check the deformity in the sagittal plane. This is one method of doing Thomas's test. We place the hand behind the hollow of the lumbar spine, try to obliterate it, stop it. When the spinous processes begin to touch the dorsum of the hand, and we read the revealed 
flexion deformity between the couch and so this is the precaution that while revealing the deformity we overdo that and but when measuring we we try to bring it we, we add the correction the correction is decided by the hand under the under the lumbar spine Thomas, so there is, I'll bring out a slight deviation, a slight controversy here for your benefit. Thomas, in his original article, this is uh, uh, pictures from the original article, 